Okay, excellent stuff. Well, it's not on five o'clock, so we'll, so we'll begin. So you're all very welcome to this open day webinar um, for the School of Geography and Planning in Cardiff University. Wherever you are in the country, I hope you're well and you're all very welcome. Um, my name is John Anderson and I'm a Professor of Human Geography in the School of Geography and Planning and I'm also the Director of Recruitment and Admissions. And my job today is to give you a brief introduction to the approach to teaching and learning that we have in the School of Geography and Planning and in particular to introduce you to some of the details about the Human Geography Programme. If you're interested in the, uh, some of our other programmes, then for those of you who are watching live, there will be another webinar this time tomorrow for our BSc in Urban Planning and Development and also our BSc in Human Geography and Planning. And of course, if you're watching a recording of this, then you'll also be able to access um, those talks on the school's YouTube page. Okay, so as you're probably aware, and as I've just outlined, we have three major programmes within the School of Geography and Planning. Um, and each one embodies our passion for the research that we do within the school. As you'll be aware, Cardiff University is a Russell Group institution, which is the equivalent of the Ivy League in the UK. It's a gold standard for the nature of the research and the impact that the school does in relation to its academic, its academic work, its academic projects. And all that expertise and authority is imbued within our three undergraduate programmes. They're all set up to not simply understand the 21st century challenges of the relationships between human societies and the geographies in which they're in, but to, to critique them and engage with them to help transform the world and make it a better place. So hopefully that's the same passion that we share with you, that we all want to engage with the world and make it better. And that's what we try to instill within our three key hum, um, undergraduate programmes, the BSc in Human Geography, the BSc in Urban Planning and Development, and the BSc in Human Geography and Planning. And this, the evidence of that instilling of our passion for research um, from, and for the interest in people and places comes from the accreditations that go along with each of these undergraduate programmes. Um, the BSc in Human Geography is accredited by the Royal Geographical Society, and it was the, one of the first programmes in the country that is simply um, a human geography degree to gain this accreditation. And just for your interest, the BSc in Urban Planning and Development is um, accredited by the Royal Town Planning Institute and the Royal Institute of Chart Surveyors, and the Geography and Planning degree but also by the Royal Town Planning Institute. And what's of interest with the RTPI accreditation is there are multiple stages to that accreditation not simply an undergraduate award, but also a year out in practice and also a postgraduate award. And that year out in practice is important because in all three of our undergraduate programmes, there is the possibility for our students to change their three-year undergraduate programme into a four-year undergraduate programme if they wish and get a paid year in placement to broaden their understanding of the world, to apply the knowledge they're getting in their programmes into a real, real life, context and broaden their experience and their portfolio for their CV, if you like, to enhance their employability once they finish that undergraduate programme. And I'll talk a little bit more about that employability aspect in a few slides time. So this passion that we have within the school for these extraordinary relationships between people and places come together on our undergraduate programmes. As you might understand, we're interested in ideas of people, place, environment and space. And what's important to note here is that most of you may be studying uh, an integrated geography degree, for example, A level or in another qualification. But within the school, we just do human geography related programs. That's not to say we don't do any physical or environmental interests, as you might um, anticipate our specialisms uh, coalesce around ideas of the economy, of development, of society and culture, but also about the environment. So if you're interested in those physical geography aspects, then you can look at, you can ask questions about the environment and the physical geographies around us with a social science lens through our undergraduate programmes. And perhaps some of that will be more clear when I um, move forward to the human geography modules themselves in a few slides time. So these range of different specialisms 
from the economy through to culture play out a whole range of scales. Of course, we're interested in the micro scale, in our own backyards, in our local communities, in our neighborhoods, and perhaps in the last sort of 18 months, two years of our lives, we've become increasingly sensitized to the importance of green spaces where we live, to clean air, to clean water, to the provision of services, to welfare, to the fairness of our societies in terms of mobility, in terms, in terms of access to these different resources. So of course, issues that concern us around the economy and the environment and development play out on our doorstep, but they also play out at a regional level and of course on a global level as well. And perhaps what's distinctive about our programs is our ability to engage both in the local and the global, to broaden our horizons, to think ourselves as citizens of not simply our neighbourhoods and our immediate communities, but our community on a global scale. And the international nature of our courses is again something I would turn to as we go through today's talk. I mentioned on the previous slide the importance of employability, evidenced not simply by our accreditations, but through the nature of what we do and the fact, of course, that over 90% of our undergraduates within six months of graduation are either pursuing postgraduate study and gaining the remainder of their accreditations on the planning courses or indeed in graduate level employment. Geography and geography and planning are always one of the top scorers, if you like, for their employability at undergraduate level. They offer a broad degree of transferable skills that employers want. They want to have that academic knowledge, but the ability to engage it with real life problems and have modules within those undergraduate programs that allow students to understand complex data sets, to engage with them, to critique them, but also create narratives and arguments on the basis of them that are persuasive. These are the sorts of skills you get through the School of Geography and Planning that are highly employable in the real world. Of course, those placements that I've mentioned um, do nothing but enhance that employability. And through many generations now, a whole range of uh, placement opportunities across our undergraduate programmes, we have great links with a whole range of business partners and sector partners to ensure that students get a highly uh, appropriate placement to enhance their undergraduate skills. And it's a point to note here, to remember for later on in the talk, there are also modules within the programmes that don't that allow you to get um, work placement experience, but don't mean you have to take a year to in uh, increase your studies to four years to, to do so. And of course, the school is part of the broader university, and so it can draw upon an excellent set of support services through careers and employability, the Global Opportunity Centre, and the Students' Union to make yourself feel part of a community. Again, something I'll come back to in a minute. Now, I won't go through this slide in depth, but perhaps it gives you an indication of the vast array of sectors that our graduates gain employment within, everything through from business and finance, through society, the civil service, the third sector, and through to a whole range of research oriented um, sectors, be that working with the census, with the ordnance survey, a whole, rate, whole, a whole range of GIS. The point being that human geography degrees particularly keep your opportunities open. Not every uh, student at the age of 18 knows precisely what they want to do, do as a career. Indeed, the whole purpose perhaps of going to university is to narrow those options down, to start thinking about what I really want to specialize in and what I really want to spend my life contributing to. And so human geography and indeed the other programs on our degrees are really great programs for that, to keeping your options open, to allowing yourself to tailor your interests through your courses and still have this vast array of potential employability options open to you at the end of your undergraduate career. I mentioned, of course, that what we're interested in in the School of Geography and Planning are these fascinating relationships between us and the world around us. And that goes for us for what we study and how we research, but also the community that we want to develop within the school. And so we play it's a high emphasis on students feeling part and parcel of our community, that they're not simply numbers in a lecture room or numbers in a seminar room, but people with names, with hopes, dreams, desires, aspirations, that they can share those with their peers, but also between those cohorts and the staff itself. So we are a very sociable school. We actively support the students own social um, societies, they everything from balls to, to dinners, to, to days out, to bake-offs, to quizzes, as well as, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, they take every opportunity to humiliate the staff in a range of 
quizzes and indeed social sports and beating us and everything from tug of war to netball to football. And it's something that we staff put up with in order for us to feel part of a community as well. We share the same passions in terms of our research and our teaching. And of course, we want to feel as if we are part of a school and the students are part of the school that cares for them, that is kind to them, that is interested in them and will support them. Again, a point I'll come back to. I've mentioned that we are an international school and here are some flags. I'm not going to test you on them. This isn't pointless quite yet although perhaps we'll turn to that in a minute. Um, but you can see these are some of the countries that our, our staff come from. We are an international school. We deal with international problems from the local up to the global scale. And again, it gives our students an opportunity to broaden their horizons and consider issues that perhaps they've not considered in this way before. They may, for example, wish to become internationalized themselves and take the opportunities to partner in one of, to study in one of our partner institutions. And there's a, an indicative list of them there. Most of these universities conduct their lectures in English. So that's not a huge problem to overcome. But should our students who wish to study abroad, or indeed any of our students wish to um, improve their language skills and abilities, they can enroll in the Languages for All programme, which is a free programme that the university runs to either um, top up your GCSE or A-level German, or whatever it happens to be, or indeed learn a new language. I want to learn Mandarin, or whatever it happens to be, in order to take advantage of the opportunities that you have at undergraduate level to study abroad, but also travel abroad. Of course, because human geography is such a doing discipline, get, getting out there in the world and making knowledge, there are a range of field study visits that are also part of our undergraduate programs. And again, I'm gonna come back to them in more detail in a few slides time. So we're the School of Geography and Planning and we're located physically, our community is located physically right in the heart of Cardiff. Hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen and you can see Cardiff Bay at the top left hand side of that image. And if we follow the River Taff up through more industrial areas of the city, we pass the Principality Stadium, what's called the Millennium Stadium. And right, that's the retail and commercial heart of the city centre there with all shops, cafes, nightclubs, bars, etc. But just a short walk from there, we come to the civic heart of the city, and this is where the university is based. Um, these are all university buildings here, and we're in that building there, the Glamorgan building, which you can see on your on the right hand side there, a classic Georgian piece of architecture. And this is a department that we share with the School of Social Sciences. Now, if it's not possible for you directly to come and visit us within the the Glamorgan building, then if you put a Google search in for the School of Geography and Planning, you will come up on that web link and you'll be able to have a virtual tour that I'll take with you around the civic heart of the city, show you where the main building is, show you what all these other civic buildings of the city are and take you into the Glamorgan building and you can see around. It's a great location to be. It's right in the heart of the city. We share this Cates Park with Welsh Assembly Government, with um, the City Council, as well as with Cardiff Museum, three key actors in the politics of Wales, really. And so we can connect our research to these actors and students can too. And I'll talk in a few slides time about the innovation and engagement series, where these actors come into this building and give talks that students can get involved with and come and chat to um, these decision makers that shape Welsh policy. So it's classic on the outside, but it's contemporary on the inside. The building has a multi-million pound investment over recent years to um, have everything that you'd anticipate a 21st century Russell Group institution could have from uh, seminar rooms to lecture rooms to cafe facilities, to have all the technology and computers that will enhance and allow you to maximize your potential at undergraduate level. Really nice spaces to be in, really nice spaces to discuss and have dialogue really nice spaces to teach in that form a really nice uh, infrastructure, if you like, for the teaching and learning that occurs in the school. So perhaps to just bring all these themes together that I've talked with so far, what we do in our undergraduate programmes is connect our academic research to real world situations and embody them down into our undergraduate programmes. There are a whole range of 
teaching and learning environments, to lecture rooms, to seminars, to teaching in the field, like the, the image on the right hand side suggests, we do everything we can to enable students to get a sense of what the world is and what they could be in the world to maximize their possibilities and really make the most of this three to four year period in their lives that could actually change the direction that they take with their life. And at the heart of everything we do is this student centered approach that allows students to feel part and parcel of our community to feel to create a sense of community both within their cohorts and across their cohorts and with the academic staff. So put that in, putting that into practice, we have a personal tutor system. Every student will be allocated an academic number of staff that will stay with them throughout their undergraduate studies as to be the person that they can call upon if they have any question about life in Cardiff, about being a student, or indeed about their modules and their programmes. Student support put in the heart of our teaching and learning too by allowing them to um, have a voice to enhance and evaluate our teaching. This may be through the student rep system where students become part of staff student panels and um, uh, represent their uh, cohorts to both the school and beyond. And all students, of course, are part of our evaluations of teaching. It happens on a, a regular ongoing basis that are composing that make sure that the, the, the way we're delivering our teaching the content that we're delivering it and our forms of assessment enable students to maximise their potential and get the most out of their undergraduate curriculum. And finally, perhaps the student mentoring scheme to allow students to feel not simply that they're part of a group, part of a degree, part of a cohort, but also part of a broader community beyond their degrees and their programmes. We have this student mentoring system so students can buddy up with students in the second year, the placement year, the final year, even in their postgraduate year, and give a sense of what they're to share experiences, to share insights in particular modules and particular programs or indeed placement opportunities about their experiences of traveling abroad or studying abroad, to gain a, a formal network of interaction so students feel supported and part of something larger. Okay. So that kind of draws to a close the first section of this talk, reflecting on our general approaches of the school, I'll now put them, uh, put a meat on those bones, if you like, and engage with the BSc in Human Geography degree more directly. Okay, so here on the slide in front of you, we have an outline of the, the BSc in Human Geography. Key things to note straight away, three columns in front of you, first year, second year, and perhaps better understood as the final year. If students want to opt into a placement year, and it's a good opportunity to say that if you want, if you're interested in applying to the School of Geography and Planning, you can apply for a three year BSc in Human Geography or a four year BSc and only confirm that choice at the end of your first year. OK, so you might enroll in the, third, in the three year undergraduate degree, but halfway through you think, actually, I'm really interested in undertaking a placement. That's completely possible to do. OK, so as long as we know by the beginning of your second year where you're at, you can opt in or opt out, change in or change out of the three or four year program up until that stage. OK, what's important to note, too, is that your second year of your degree contributes 30 percent to your overall degree classification. And the 70 percent of your overall degree classification is therefore the contribution of your final year of assessment. So your first year of assessment doesn't contribute to your overall degree classification, but you do need to pass that degree. And as you'll note, the other key thing from this slide is that there are modules in red and modules in black. In, in the first year of the geography degree, every module is core. We feel it's really important to give you these core building blocks of knowledge to allow you to then specialize in year two and year three, to be ready for your placements if you're interested in doing that, or ready to specialize in particular themes that we mentioned on an earlier slide, be they cultural development, environment, et cetera, et cetera. So in year one, everything is core. Cool. We have a module on the geographical imagination, encouraging you to begin thinking geographically, but a, 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 in terms of the social sciences at the university, what sort of critical questions are we asking? What sort of theories and ideas are we employing in order to understand and engage with the world out there? From that core module, 
it's almost twinned, if you like, with this making knowledge, knowledge, knowledge module that's listed at the bottom there. A useful knowledge to a useful module to transit, make that transition between schools, colleges, sixth forms, and universities. How do academics make knowledge? What sort of questions do they ask? What sort of methods do they employ to begin kitting you out with the whole range of doings of human geography so you can go out in the world and ask those questions and conduct that research yourself that you will be doing in year two and your final year. This module of making knowledge not only kits you out with being able to understand these complex data sets, but deal with them, critique them, and indeed, as we said before, articulate them in a whole manner of different ways. That might be in the academic essay, but it also might be in research reports, in executive summaries, in press releases, in websites, in contributions to public inquiries, all the things that you may need to do in the world of work. So we align our assessments with this diverse array of communication mechanisms that our students need to know and become and get to know through the course of their undergraduate degree, beginning, beginning with that making knowledge module. The rest of the modules in year one are these core modules that set you up for the streams that will come, or the specialisms that will come in year two and the final year. This may be living, living with environmental change, for example, where we conduct those sorts of ideas you may be more familiar with, with physical geography, but apply them in a social science context that form the basis and the foundations for modules such as sustainable development, concepts, practices and challenges in year two, and the climate change and environmental governance module in the final year. The module on border spaces thinks about the politics, the economies, the cultures, the societies that are associated with our globalizing world and the tensions that we've all lived through in the last few years about how they play out in terms of migration, in terms of Brexit, in terms of inequalities, in terms of issues of mobility. And of course, these themes play through in our second and our final year through modules such as cultural geographies, political geography, social geography in year two, for example, and cities and social justice, mobilities, gender and race in the final year. Issues of cities and the global countryside have their own modules in year one to again form the basis for these specialisms, specialisms excuse me, maybe for example, cities and social justice in the final year or themes about development and the global south that play out both in year two and the final year. Now, I mentioned earlier on about the possibility to gain work experience within the geography degree without having to take a year out in placement. And if we cast our eye to the column of year two, we can see at the bottom there, the geographies of work and employability module. This module works in close uh, coordination with the Royal Geographical Society. So students become, can become RGS ambassadors and go back to their, their schools of origin, if you like, and talk about their experiences at university and the wonders of doing geography at university, but it also gives them the opportunity to gain a short voluntary placement in a range of different organizations that the university has connections with. And again, gain an extent of work experience to see how the themes that we deal with in the module play out in the real world and augment their CV. Also, perhaps it's a really useful module to help form the basis of ideas for the research dissertation that happens in the year three module. So in year two, there are a whole range of specialist modules, including geographies of work and employability. These all enhance the core modules, geographical ideas, a module about geographical theory, for example, how feminism, how post-structuralism, how Marxism, how post-colonialism have influenced how we think about the world and how useful these theoretical ideas are to engage with that world and critique it. This goes hand in hand with the research methods module that builds on making knowledge and gives students more advanced understanding of a whole range of research methods that again can feed into what they do in the research dissertation. So hopefully you can see this isn't just a disparate array of random modules. These are discrete modules that our research feeds into that build, gives you building blocks for specialisms and the core modules in year two and the final year. Perhaps the last thing I mentioned, or two more things I want to mention about this slide, is the final year research dissertation. It's an independent project. 
that our students undertake, putting into practice all their ideas from their from their modules so far, from the things they do in their, from their hobbies and their societies, maybe from their work placements, maybe from their study abroad. This is the thing that I'm super passionate about. This is the thing that has focused all my excitement and ignited all those ideas that I've had in all those modules. And this is the thing that I want to study. They articulate a research proposal through the developing research methods module. And then they're paired up with a member of staff who guides them through that process of um, doing their own independent piece of research and producing an output in the form of a research dissertation. Now, it's this research dissertation that often helps cement students' ideas about what they want to do after they finish their undergraduate level. Maybe it opens the door for a placement opportunity. In many cases, it opens the door for an employment opportunity. A whole host of our students have done work with, I don't know, charitable organisations or homeless, homeless um, third sector opportunities or with the civil service or with a range of private enterprises and been offered a job as a consequence of that engagement with them. People are working for Sky Media, people are working for Virgin with Richard Branson and his space travel things as a consequence of the weird and wonderful ideas our students bring to the, the modules and articulate through their research dissertations. Okay, the second and final point I want to make in relation to this side is draw your attention to these contemporary issues modules that occur both in year two and the final year. These are our field study visit modules. Now, historically, up until the event of COVID, we have always gone on international study trips as for our field study visits, both in the second year and our final year. There are field study visits in year one, and these are often local to the Cardiff city region to allow students to get under the skin of the area that they're gonna call home for the next three to four years of their life. In the second and the final year, we've always thought it important to take students out there in the world and see some of these global issues that are part and parcel of the modules that we engage with. But of course, in the last 18 months or so, this has been hugely problematic and has coincided with uh, a sector-wide review, if you like, on the utility of international field study visits in the third decade of the 21st century, with advances in pedagogic mechanisms, in the use of virtual reality, with the use of um, mechanisms technology that we're using now to engage with you across the ether. Is it still important, the sector itself is asking, whether we engage with international travel fueled by jet aircraft and engaging with a carbon footprint as a consequence of doing so. So the school is playing a leading role in this sectoral review. Um, and this is ongoing at the moment. So our current students at an undergraduate level, echoing the student focus that we have within the School of Geography and Planning are contributing to this debate. And it will be at the end of this academic year that we decide on the future of field study visits. Are we going to do them virtually through headsets and travel around the world that way? Are we going to do slow field study visits in more local locations? Or are we still going to engage in overseas field study visits? Are we going to allow students to decide and bring that debate and active consequence of should academic departments such as ours be walking it like we talk it and embed carbon neutral activities at the heart of what we do. This is the moment that we're in. So what I'm gonna to outline to you now is what we did pre-pandemic with the watching brief of what we're going to do when things open up and go back to more or less business as usual. Do we want still business as usual or do we want something different? So pre-pandemic, what we used to do is the second year modules used to go to uh, a European center, be it Amsterdam for the human geography degree, Copenhagen or Berlin, another option for the human geography degree. And in the final year, go to global destinations. Exciting, but not without their consequences. Um, we used to go to South Africa, Los Angeles and New Orleans. And it may well be the case that we return to those with perhaps some form of carbon offsetting or with some sort of uh, I don't know, advisory notice associated with this in terms of health and safety, but also in terms of environmental impact. What's important to know that if we do return to what we did before, all second year excursions were fee inclusive, so there was no extra cost associated with those, um, with, with those optional, with, for those students who wish to take these option modules. And in the final year, 
they were subsidized by the by the university um, to the tune of 66%. So students who wished to go on these trips got a subsidized trip and had to pay a third of the associated costs with those trips. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a really useful insight into some of the particulars uh, about the human geography degree. But of course, if you have any questions about them, please put them into the chat and I'll deal with them all at the end of, of the slides. I'll just move on in this final portion to talk about some of the generic features about uh, um, the way the degree is delivered and indeed the admissions process. So we're nearly at the end, stay with me. So students study six modules per year with a pro with a approximate contact time of anything between 12 and 15 hours, depending on the module and depending on the year. We're moving back into face-to-face -face delivery of, of um, lectures and seminars. Currently, we're delivering small scale seminars face to face, and we, as we have done for the last 12 to 18 months, deliver lectures in short um, asynchronous podcasts. So students can have the material, have the PowerPoint, have the questions, have everything that they need um, delivered through our virtual mechanism of Learning Central, and students can pause them, watch them at Sir Leser, play them back, have their subtitles on them, et cetera, et cetera. So everything, um, everything goes as well as it can through this technology. And we've been really pleased how students have not simply engaged with these materials, but been really happy with these materials. Clearly, it doesn't necessarily replicate the community spirit of being in a lecture room together, but their um, learning experience is has been maximized to the degree it can be through these new delivery mechanisms. So in normal situations, we teach in a whole manner of ways, through lectures, through seminars, through field study visits, through studio work, through workshops. And as I mentioned before, not simply is our given curricula there for students to engage with, but also we have extracurricular activities drawn and we draw on the key local stakeholders that make up part and parcel of what we do as a school, be they Welsh Assembly Government, be they the City Council, be they a whole range of local businesses, um, actors from Welsh Government, actors from the European Union, actors from the United Nations. The people that we engage with through our research, we bring into the school and form part of our innovation and engagement series of lectures that allow students to meet them, greet them, have a glass of wine and some and some cheese with them. And it's kind of sounds kind of social and it is, but it performs a really useful professional function as well, because we get to see that these are human beings. We get to see how they operate and we get to talk to them, to engage with them, to make ourselves known with them, to make yourself known with them as a potential place, a potential person you could perhaps could work with for your dissertation later on in your undergraduate career. So a whole range of evening seminars that support our given curricula. I mentioned earlier too about the diversity of ways in which we encourage students to articulate the knowledge that they gain through their undergraduate curriculum. And this slide points towards the variety of assessments that um, we ask our students to do. Now this is indicative of year one, okay? So we can see that actually it's a relatively small percentage of our assessments that are through the conventional examination. So we do presentations, group projects, essays, and indeed a variety of other coursework. So you can see how they're proportionately broken down in year one. What's important to note too, is that in the second year and the final year, the examination thing reduces even further down. As, as far as I can remember, there are no examinations in the final year. It's all through this diverse ways of knowing. So students can have a portfolio of mechanisms through which they can articulate their knowledge, which is so important when we think about their employability in the real world but it also acknowledges the different ways that students learn and the different skills and abilities they may have. So they can identify their strengths, but also identify their weaknesses and bring them up to a certain level. So they are well equipped in all the mechanisms of articulation and persuasion and argument that will befit them whatever they choose to do after their undergraduate experience. The last few slides I want to share with you are just about our entry requirements. And we can see the entry of the typical offers that are made for human geography for the cohort that we're predominantly interested in here. And again, the International Baccalaureate equivalent there. You will be made a typical offer in that range. But what's important too, and what many applicants 
engaging with the UCAS process for the first time, perhaps have a lot of questions about, about the personal statements. First point to make, it's really, it, it, we read them. We are interested in them. The personal statement is the opportunity that you have to communicate with us your passion for the subject that you're interested in. Now that might be in relation to the job that you do. It might be a place where you studied on holiday. It may be a gap year that you went on. It may be that you just work in the local supermarket and you've become interested in where goods come from, or how mobility happens, how eco labels are used. It doesn't matter if it's big and extraordinary and exotic or local and apparently mundane. Share it with us, imbue it with your enthusiasm. Make us feel as if you're going to be a really interesting person to have in our seminar and contribute to our debates. We want those type of people who are curious, who want to know about the world and think that human geography or indeed one of our other programs is the mechanism for you to further that interest and knowledge. Get that down in your personal statement. There isn't a wrong thing to write in that, but we want to look and feel as if there's a 3D human being in that because we want those people as part of our school. So there are steps in this process. We make you an offer, you will receive formal notification of that offer, and hopefully you will be able to attend a formal uh, in-person open day, perhaps in the new year in January, February, through to March, April, May. The final thing to note is the offer guarantee scheme that we're running as a whole university rather than simply a school. And this offer guarantee scheme is applicable to those who make us their firm choice. If those students who make, who make us a firm choice, we want to acknowledge that they made a commitment to us. They could have put any university as their firm choice, but they've chosen us. We're grateful for that. And we, if we've made you an offer, kind of, we want you here, and you've put us first choice. But we are aware that up to 50% of students miss their grades, sometimes by one grade, through the A-level process or whatever qualification you're doing. And the offer guarantee scheme acknowledges that process through often for no fault of your own. Um, students can miss a degree, miss a, a, a grade in their A-levels, for example. The offer guarantee scheme says, if you miss one grade, we will honor the offer that we make to you. And should you wish university accommodation, we will guarantee that you will still get that university accommodation in your first year of study, if you wish to. So how that plays out in practice, you might be made an offer, for example, of AAB to study human geography. If you put us first choice and end up with ABB, everything's good. It just takes away a little bit of the anxiety that you will all be facing, not simply in the world we're living in at the moment, but going through your A-levels and thinking about university. Okay, hopefully that's been of use to you. That's the last slide that I want to share with you. And now I'm going to turn to the Q&As. So if you've got any Q&As, um, please add to that and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, Oliver asked, can we receive a copy of this recording? Yes, you can. Um, once it's all rendered, etc., I will put it on the School of Geography and Planning's YouTube homepage that I mentioned earlier on. So if you just Google School of Geography and Planning YouTube, this page will come up and you'll not only see this recording, you'll see the recording that's made tomorrow uh, about our other two undergraduate programs and you will see the kind of recorded tour that I've done of uh, Cate's Park and the Glamorgan building. Are there study abroad options? Hopefully I might have covered that, but yes, there are our study, study abroad options. There are a range of partner universities that we have that in the second semester of your second year, it's possible for you to go and study abroad. And if you're interested in this and you know straight away in year one when you start, and you talk to perhaps your personal tutor and confirm which partner universities you could go to. If there isn't the country or the city that you want to go to, that gives us time in the next 12 months to set up an institutional arrangement. So it is possible for you to go abroad. Those partner institutions, we have identified modules in those institutions that are delivered in, 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 delivered in English and cover the broad thematic areas that mirror the modules that you'd be missing because you're not in the UK. And those modules can then be lifted up and form part of the credit weighting of your BSc qualification with us. Okay, hopefully that's answered your question. But what are some of the examples of the work placements? Well, in a whole range of areas from uh, 
local planning authorities, particularly for the planning um, areas for, oh, crikey, um, unitary authorities, uh, charitable organisations, working in the civil service, working in local social enterprise, working in local voluntary groups, Welsh Assembly government. We've had people going in institutional levels of government above that, be they in Westminster, be they in Transport for London, be they in uh, DEFRA. We've even had students who've gone to places like Hong Kong and Beijing to do their placements because they have an international focus of their inquiry. So the world is your oyster in relation to these things. We have as I've mentioned, a whole kind of institutional knowledge of these stakeholders, because we've been doing this for, I don't know, 50 years as a department. Um, and so we can support students in identifying the sectors that they're interested in and the likely um, employers within those sectors. And then we can support students making those connections with those employers and hopefully securing the right placement for them. Georgie asks, I'm interested in doing a work placement here. What kind of environmental placement companies do you have connections with? Now, Georgie, I'm not going to pretend that I know all the range of specific companies that we um, have connections with, but you can either drop me an email or drop the school an email, or um, I th yes, I think that would be best rather than giving out a, a, a member of staff's email about that. And I can forward it to the member of staff who's our employment's coordinator. And I can give you them some specific answers, answers to that through him, if you like. OK, great. If our current UCAS grades are one below, what would you typically offer? Um, how likely is it to make an offer? Um, we'll look at your um, uh, personal statement, uh, Anonymous. Um, I think actually, if the only thing that is missing, if you like, from uh, 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 an, an ideal candidate for us, then we would make an offer probably in the middle of the grade range and hope you attain the grade. But if you were to fall short more than the grades, and, I, and you, I, in other words, you are outside the offer guarantee scheme, it's not impossible that you won't get a place through the adjustment confirmation and clearing week. That week, the A-level results are released in August. There's a little bit more anxiety about that because no university can guarantee that situation if you're just below. But if you've put us first choice and you made that commitment to us, then the school is actively open to do what it can to accept, to accept those students. That's, that's the best we can offer at this stage. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Um, is human geography a very diversified subject? Hopefully I've given you some indication of the range of different specialist themes that occur within human geography. If you wish to know a little bit more about our particular modules, if you go on the school website, as opposed to the YouTube page, you can click on the human geography link and there'll be a drop down menu of all the different modules with an outline of what they cover, how they're assessed, the sorts of different learning objectives within them. And hopefully through that, you can get an even more detailed detailed feel of the sorts of questions, themes, ideas, subjects that human geography covers. So everything from gender, through race, through mobility, through inequality to social justice, to taking down the Colston statue in, um, in Bristol, to the inequalities in Namibia and Southeast Asia, to Oh, informal economies of street markets in Peru through um, the social transformation of post-Soviet Russia and how energy systems are affecting what we do in the UK and issues of you know, fuel crises and all these sorts of things. This is what human geography covers and everything in between. So yes, please um, look at the, the, the subject area of the school's website and you'll be able to see all this rich diversity hopefully in front of you there. Uh, Neil asks, um, oh, are the study board options one year or one semester? If I wasn't clear, I apologise. It's one semester, one semester in your second year. Okay. How many students applied relative to total places given in 2021, please? Really good question, Neil. I don't have the data ahead of him. What I can, can say, it's normally a ratio of, I don't know, oh, crikey, all right, that's difficult. It's different for each programme. Across the whole school, it's normally perhaps four applications, one place. Normally, we have an intake of about 175. In 
the undergraduate cohort as a whole, and that's normally split in half. So about maybe 80, 85 on the human geography program. And then the other two programs are split equally, about 40 students on one, approximately 40, 45 students on the other. We will class ourselves as a, a mid-range, that's a mid-range intake. A lot of our competitors, if you want to call it that, will have anything from 220, 250, 300 students, which makes obviously very large lectures. So if we've got, let's say, 80 on a human geography program, we can have relatively small lectures. And then when we do our seminars, splitting students up into much smaller groups, perhaps uh, groups of 20 or 25, then we can have real discussions, meaningful discussions about the, the issues that we're playing out in a far more uh, 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 easy, collaborative environment for discussion. So uh, that question about do we have to turn a lot of people away kind of connects to Neil's, Neil's, um, uh, Neil's question. Um, it's interesting that all these issues kind of play about almost the popularity of human geography as a subject. Human geography is, is quite a popular subject, perhaps not import, uh, as important as something like law or business, but still far more uh, popular than, an, than the average subject. And what we're seeing across the whole sector is a gradual increase in geography applications. And so to some extent, that's making it slightly more competitive. But what I would um, encourage you the way, the way I would encourage all of you to think about it is choose a program, choose a place, choose a university that you feel that you will do well in, that you feel at home in, that you feel you belong in, somewhere that shares the passions that you have, because that's where you will excel. You need to feel as if you want to get out of bed in the morning. You want to feel as if you, you are excited about the modules that you're studying, the assessments that you're doing, the people that you're working with in your cohort, the lecturers that you're working with, the place where you live. Visit those places if you can, um, but also use whatever virtual resources that you can and choose the place that is right for you. I'm a firm believer that everything will follow from that. OK, so don't necessarily worry about how many people are competing with you for a place or the amount of students that apply. Be led by your passions and you won't go far wrong. Okay, as I go through the Q&As, uh, would a BTEC extended diploma be sent at the same levels as A-levels? Yes, it would be anonymous. You, um, uh, or we've been talking about A-levels just because it's good shorthand for um, that level of qualification. If you go on the UCAS tariff, website, you can see all the range of diverse qualifications that all university would take seriously. So we would offer you the equivalent in whatever alternative, in inverted commas, uh, A-level qualifications that you have. And all universities would be similar in that. So don't worry about that. I think I've gone through all the Q&As, but I know there is something in the chat. So I'm just turned to that. OK, I think Lucy, I might have just answered that one in the Q&A too? Hopefully that I have. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for attending. Hopefully that was of use to you. Um, if you've got any further questions, you are very welcome to contact me by email. If you go onto the school's website, then you will be able to find me under staff or indeed just um, email our student services team, which is just GMP inquiries at cardiff.ac.uk and you will be forwarded to the correct member of staff and we will answer your query with pleasure. Okay, thank you for your time today. It's um, great that you stayed with me to the end and um, I hope that was useful to you. So I'll close down the webinar now, thank you.